I'm supposed to die in France. I never ever saw France. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and as requested, today we'll be exploring Pitch Black, the 2000 sci-fi action thriller written and directed by David Twohey, starring Rada Mitchell, Cole Hauser, Keith David, and the legendary Vin Diesel. Pitch Black is essentially about a space transport vessel named the Hunter Gratzna, which is said to be carrying 40 people prior to being struck by a meteor storm that caused the ship to crash on a desert planet. With only 11 survivors, including the ship's docking pilot, a religious man and his children, a bounty hunter, a convict named Riddick, an arts dealer, and a number of others, the group begin to realize that the barren desert had three suns that kept the planet in perpetual sunlight. Not only must they find supplies and worry about the dangerous Riddick, but before long, they come to realize that they themselves were now being hunted by the planet's flesh-eating creatures. These bioraptors would only emerge during darkness, and due to the three suns and their orbit, they were kept underground for 22 years, before emerging during an eclipse when the planet was engulfed in darkness for a month. Beginning as a sci-fi drama, the emergence of the creatures plunges the film into horror territory as our characters attempt to survive the Horde, while learning a few valuable lessons along the way, including but not limited to, not judging a book by its cover, and not messing with Richard B. Riddick. The film was directed by David Twohey, who began his career as a screenwriter, developing scripts for films like Critters 2, Warlock, Waterworld, G.I. Jane, and one of my personal favourites, The Fugitive. David admitted that while he'd not been pleased with how some of the films had turned out, he learnt a valuable lesson about how scripts would change once the films were in production, stating, The only way it gets better for the writer is if the writer directs their own films. The director was then approached in 1998 by Interscope Pictures through its parent company Polygram with a story that two other writers had cooked up, promising that if he could refine the screenplay, he would have free reign over the project as director. The script, which was then called Nightfall, was originally written by brothers Ken and Jim Wheat, who'd worked on films like Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Fly 2, as well as the Star Wars TV movie, Ewoks, The Battle for Endor, which they also directed. In their script, the basic outline was in place, with a ship crash landing on an alien planet, a major eclipse, photophobic monsters and blood. However, there were a handful of changes made by David, like the reimagining of the convict from a female to a male named Riddick. David was actually one of the many writers brought in for Alien 3, and having worked on the project's infancy, he noted a lot of similarities to Alien, which led him to make some changes, especially with regards to the arcs of the characters. The director believed that Alien had stock characters that reacted to what was going on, explaining, In Pitch Black, I've got three characters who not only change from where they begin, but also change where you expect them to end up. While David was specifically talking about Riddick, Fry and Johns, I actually believe that Imam al-Walid and Jack also go through the same process, as both of them are fundamentally changed by the experience. It's fucking right. Watch your mouth. Hey, he's just saying what we're all thinking. Pitch Black was made with a modest budget of 25 million, and though the studio suggested the use of A-list actors, the director insisted they go with fresher faces as he believed they would work harder, especially with regards to the action set pieces, stating, Let's face it, if Nicolas Cage is in the movie, you know he'll be standing for most of the day while his stunt double did most of the physical work, something he hoped to avoid at all costs. Vin Diesel, who had personally written, directed and starred in numerous short films, impressed Steven Spielberg so much he was given a small role in Saving Private Ryan, which was followed by him providing the voice for the Iron Giant in 1999. I think it should be noted that his first short film, Multifacial, which was a semi-autobiographical drama about a multiracial actor stuck in the audition process, was selected for screening at the 1995 Cannes Film Festival. Diesel then went on to write and direct his first feature-length film, Strays, in which he played a gang leader searching for meaning in his life, which was also selected for competition in 1997 at the Cannes Film Festival. Given his passion for film, his perseverance, hard work and physical size, Twohey immediately cast Diesel as Riddick after his first screen test. Not only was this a great casting choice for the film, but it was also the perfect opportunity for the actor to break free of the disappointing audition cycle that his short film was based on, with Pitch Black subsequently launching Vin Diesel into Hollywood, who was then cast as the one and only Dominic Toretto in The Fast and Furious the following year. 76 days out, lucky 18. <laughs> I'm grabbing a lift from a long range transport, uh, hung or something. The son of a bitch is finally in cryo. The film opens with a space transport ship, the Hunter Gratzner, carrying 40 people on board in cryosleep across open space. 
22 weeks into its journey and several weeks away from their next stop, the ship is struck by debris from a meteor storm which immediately pierces the hull, forcing the crew out of their slumber. After waking up, the docking pilot, Caroline Fry, realizes that not only was the captain dead, but that the ship had now been knocked into the atmosphere of a nearby planet. With no means of communication, and with the ship now descending to the planet's surface at extreme speeds, she tries to control the descent, but the rear heavy craft refuses to stabilize, forcing the pilot to begin jettisoning rear sections sequentially. In the heat of the moment, and with no other apparent option, Fry attempts to jettison the passenger cabin as well, but is stopped by Owen, the ship's navigator, who stops her by blocking the airlock and demanding that she find another way. Now, Fry is able to crash land the vessel, but in doing so, loses much of the ship, its inhabitants, and cargo along the way. What I love most about this film is the moral ambiguity that clowns the characters and their choices. Yes, it's true that Fry had a responsibility to the passengers, but in that split moment when she thought that she had no other choice, she nearly killed all of them to save herself. This moral dilemma is also present with both Riddick and Johns. Now, Johns is the bounty hunter that has caught Riddick and is transporting him to prison, and though this seems like a noble act, everything he does is for himself and not the betterment of others. A great example of this is after the crash when the navigator is impaled and dying a slow and painful death, and instead of giving him the ship's painkillers, we later find out that Johns had actually kept them to feed his opioid addiction. Riddick on the other hand is a criminal, there is no doubt about it, and has probably murdered hundreds of people, and while he does look out for himself, he has a very clear honor code, and often puts his needs aside to help others. Sometimes you gotta get a little dirty to catch a killer. But this ain't thieves among thieves, you see. The law has the truths and commerce more than justice. If you want commerce in the universe, laws must be obeyed and enforced. To this end, private bounty hunters, mercenaries, or mercs, are paid bounties to collect the worst of the worst. You take no chances. And when in doubt, remember the bounties are dead or alive. Riddick spends the majority of the first act blindfolded, chained and tied inside the ship, while the rest of the survivors explore the shipwreck around them. With limited food and water, and with the heat of the sun bearing down on them, the group make their way towards what they believe to be trees, hoping to find water nearby. But as they got closer, they soon realized that these were the giant skeletal remains of an ecosystem that was long gone. While the group looks for supplies, Riddick manages to escape using his fury and physiology to break free of the chains. I talk a lot about the powers he had and the unique quality of his eyes in my video about the Furians, and the Bioraptors which inhabited the planet, in videos I'll leave links to below, and if you haven't seen them, I recommend that you check them out after this video. Miraculously, the survivors soon stumble upon a small settlement that had been abandoned by humans, though there seemed to be no actual sign of them now. Caroline then finds a model of the planet's solar system, which showed that there were three suns and three planets between them. The middle one is explained as being the one on which they'd landed, and with the suns on either side, the planets appeared as though they got everlasting sunlight. Much to their delight, they also discover a small shuttle spacecraft, giving the group hope in a near hopeless situation. Unfortunately for everyone, this positivity is soon eclipsed with a number of horrible incidents that begin occurring, foreshadowing the darkness that would soon befall them all. With the escape of Riddick, the group become extremely nervous and twitchy, especially after hearing his notorious history, and when a figure appears in front of the ship, one of the passengers shoots him, thinking him to be Riddick, but as the man dies, they soon realize that he was also a passenger that had fallen from the crash, miraculously survived and walked kilometers towards the ship, only to be gunned down. Another survivor named Zeke is then pulled into a hole and dragged into the tunnel by some unseen force, and when the group arrive at the location where he disappeared, they find the place covered in blood and Riddick nearby. Riddick is once again captured by Johns who removes his protective goggles, blinding him with the sun before taking him in, and though the group accuse him of the deed, Riddick assures them that he is no longer the group's biggest problem, hinting that something they hadn't seen had taken Zeke instead. Believing Riddick's story, Caroline ventures into the tunnel to investigate what happened to Zeke, where she's attacked by creatures in the hole before being pulled out to safety. Now with bigger problems to handle, and needing Riddick's help to prep the shuttle back at the settlement, Johns unchains the Fury and promises him freedom in return for his cooperation. We had a big dropship take him off planet. These people didn't leave. Come on. Whoever got Z got them. They're all dead. Though the group assumed that the settlement's former residents were geologists who had left the planet after their work was complete, Riddick informs them that the former occupants had all died. This is confirmed when one of the pilgrims enters a room and is consumed by the creatures who fly back down into a coring shaft, and after throwing a flare to see what was below, they find a number of human skulls and skeletons, leading Riddick to postulate that the geologists had likely hidden there to stay safe, not knowing that the creatures could attack them from both above and below. To make matters worse, after returning to the solar system model back at the settlement, they also realize that every 22 years, the planet succumbed to a total eclipse that lasted for a month. And with the sun going down and the imminent emergence of the Bioraptors in their thousands, the group scrambled to collect the power cells from the hunter and transport them to the shuttle. 
One by one, they begin falling to the voracious Biraptors that rule the planet, and as their predicament took a turn for the worst, we started to see the characters for who they really were. Johns reveals himself to be a selfish coward by attempting to coerce Riddick into killing Jack to lure the creatures away from the group, while Riddick shows his true colours by fighting Johns and leaving him to die at the hands of the Biraptors. I think it's also important to note that Caroline also undergoes a profound change in the film, as throughout the story she's riddled with guilt after previously attempting to sacrifice the others to save herself, but by the end of the film she essentially puts them ahead of her own needs, and even goes back to save Riddick, sacrificing her life for his in the process. After dealing some fury and vengeance involving a hand-to-hand -hand scuffle with a few of the Bioraptors, Riddick is ultimately able to start the shuttle and leave the planet with the two remaining survivors, Jack and Imam, both of whom make an appearance in the film's incredible sequel, The Chronicles of Riddick. There'll be nobody here, please. People on the top rank are safe over here, thank you. Quiet on the set, please. Kuru PD was very overwhelming to see, let alone shoot it. I like it, you know. It's good for focus, but there's really nothing out there except kangaroos and rocks and dirt. I think it gets to your head a little bit. Pitch Black was shot in the South Australian desert over a period of 60 days that included 6 day weeks and gruelling 17 hour days. This was of course the same location used for Mad Max and with the numerous difficulties faced with shooting here, the English born Australian cinematographer David Egby, who'd worked on Mad Max, had been called in to shoot the picture. Due to the tremendous heat in summer, they were forced to shoot the film in winter, which meant that it was relatively cool during the day, and to ensure that it looked hot on screen, the cast were misted with water to give the appearance of sweat in between takes. The creative team were also very careful to avoid the look and feel of well-known creatures and aliens featured in films, and the early notes they were working with described the Bioraptors as great white sharks melded with pterodactyls with the killer instinct of lions that would not hesitate to kill their own. While the film received mixed reviews upon release, the film was a commercial success, pulling in more than twice what was spent on the budget. This ultimately paved the way for the two sequels, The Chronicles of Riddick and Riddick, though it should be noted that Vin Diesel went above and beyond to ensure the sequel saw the light of day. In 2012, Diesel explained that he had turned down $20 million to star in Too Fast Too Furious, and used over $50,000 of his own money to develop the draft for The Chronicles of Riddick. Now, Polygram Pictures, which had originally developed Pitch Black, became a subsidiary of Universal Pictures in 1999, and due to his working relationship with Universal in 2011, with his role in The Fast and the Furious, Diesel leveraged his cameo in The Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift to ensure that a sequel for Pitch Black in the form of The Chronicles of Riddick would be taken seriously by the production company. This obviously worked with both The Fast and the Furious franchise and the Riddick saga taking off, cementing Vin Diesel's position as one of the definitive action stars of the 2000s. Well, that's all for today, folks. Big thanks to all of you guys who requested we take a closer look at Pitch Black. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content. And if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.